to make sure you're in the right room, we're here talking about building and fire impacts related to the marijuana industry. If you're not interested in that, you might want to leave. I'll try some jokes, but I'm not that funny. Oh. <laughs> Party foul. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with some introductions. My name is Jill jennings Golick, and I am one of the deputy directors for Denver's Community Planning and Development Department. Our Community Planning and Development Department does everything from citywide neighborhood planning, creating and managing our zoning code, as well as zoning and building, permitting, and inspections, which is why we are here today talking about marijuana. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Prisco. Um, I'm the engineer, architect, director, and um, building official um, for City and County Denver. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Browning. I supervise the architectural and structural plan review team, uh, but also be speaking today for some of the uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing aspects related to the marijuana industry permitting. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Skomel. I am the operations supervisor in fire prevention. Um, we are responsible for inspecting and issuing permits in all of the marijuana facilities. And I also have one of my inspectors with us today. My name is Mark Rudolph, I'm with the uh, fire prevention. I'm a, one of the inspectors and we inspect anything that has marijuana in it, uh, building wise. <laughs> Is it on the screen? Can people see a presentation? Okay. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of overall about the process and how we fit into uh, regulating the marijuana, it, marijuana industry and then give you just a brief, very, very brief um, discussion about how zoning and land use comes into play as well related to marijuana. So as you can see on the screen, there's a whole process for licensed marijuana businesses. And the first step in that process is typically with our zoning group within community planning and development. So you have to have that zoning use permit to essentially go to the Department of Excise and Licenses and submit for a license application. As part of that, you also need to bring your building up to code to do whatever it is you want to do, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so that's the building permit process. And as part of that building permit review, Denver Fire is also reviewing those plans and potentially issuing separate permits. Um, so once you have your appropriate permits, then you get your building um, constructed and we sign off on your certificate of occupancy. We then will typically sign off on a license application in order to actually start operating as a marijuana business. So in terms of land use, uh, we regulate marijuana in the city primarily by licensing codes and licensing laws. And then those licensing codes refer to specific land uses within our zoning code under which those specific license types are allowed to operate. So you can see a chart here. Hopefully it's um, big enough to read. Over the last year, we've added um, two more license types, which require the identification of additional appropriate um, land uses from a zoning perspective. So if you are wanting to grow marijuana, you could either have a medical or recreational optional premises cultivation. And from a land use perspective, for us, that's a plant husbandry land use. So you can um, see on the chart there all the corresponding land uses and then the licenses that go along with that. And we have amended this over the years. We worked in 2015 to expand and add language to our zoning code for marijuana-infused products manufacturers because we didn't have a lot of clarity around extractions and really the appropriate land use for that. So we added a use to the licensing code against that license and then added further clarification based on what we were seeing in terms of extractions to separate out where you could do solvent-based extraction and then other types of extraction. First and foremost, focused around that you have to make food for some of our land uses like commercial food preparation and sales. And in zoning, unlike maybe what you may have heard from environmental health, we do not treat marijuana extraction, um, the oil, as a food product. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Joe. Okay, I'm going to discuss briefly the building permit review uh, process um, from a pretty high level. Um, of course, if there are questions following the presentation, feel free to come up and uh, speak with us individually. Um, we follow, each project needs to follow um, a relatively specific uh, process in order to obtain the appropriate permits for legal construction occupancy and operation. Um, it's important to recognize that I'm not speaking with respect to licenses from an excise and license perspective. I'm speaking with respect to permits, um, not just on the building code side, um, but related to uh, building code compliance, mechanical code, plumbing code, electrical code, fire code, zoning code, health code, um, and other aspects as associated with transportation, serious and drainage, which is also known as wastewater. Um, separate reviews and permits are necessary um, for most of these, depending on uh, the scope of work for the project um, that you're working on. Uh, we have um, significantly improved our plan review times for these processes in terms of new or modified buildings. And um, the, I guess what I'll say one catch is that we don't do uh, what we call an over-the-counter review or a same-day permit um, for the vast majority of marijuana-related occupancies. So if you have a grow facility that you're modifying um, in the grow area, um, you'll need to log that project in for review. Um, but for the smaller projects, uh, less than a million dollar valuation. Um, we have generally around a two week turnaround time for that first review, um, which is uh, pretty reasonable and pretty good compared to uh, where we at as a department um, six, eight months ago. Well, let me mention one quick exception to that with respect to the walkthrough review for any existing facilities. Um, we do have a policy on this that I'll touch on briefly, but uh, if you're uh, if you have a, a sales operation and you're making minor modifications that are not a change of occupancy um, within a business or sales area, um, it, with some limitations, um, it's possible that we can do that on an over-the-counter or a same-day review. I'm going to speak briefly now about some of the plan review issues that we commonly see across a number of the trades. Um, I'll speak just to those that you see on your screen um, and some of the other trades, uh, specifically in fire, health department, uh, serious and drainage. Um, they'll be discussed separately or we can talk about those um, in a Q&A session afterwards. Um, but with respect to those on the screen, some of the most common issues that we have from a plan review perspective on the electrical side have to do with the correct identification of um, continuous load, um, simply providing one-line diagrams um, is something that unfortunately is often missed uh, quite frequently um, and often we can't do our, our job to do the correct review from a safety perspective um, without that one-line diagram. One thing I want to make sure is um, clear is that the state of Colorado and also uh, city and county of Denver moved over to the 2017 National Electric Code in July, I believe it was July 1st. And so any documentation from an electrical perspective that is submitted needs to reference the 2017 National Electric Code. A few other issues related to electrical have to do with coordinating the lighting. Um, especially across other disciplines, if the architectural and the electrical plans are different, that can cause delays from something that's quite easily uh, remediated on the front end just by coordinating your architectural and electrical trades. Um, equipment has to be listed. Uh, that means typically uh, UT, uh, UL or an ETL listing, um, but um, unlisted equipment uh, is unlikely to be uh, accepted or approved, regardless of whether it went through the appropriate review process um, or if by chance it was installed without permit, um, it's unlikely to be legitimized by going through the review and inspection process if it's not listed. 
Um, finally, upgrading the electrical service is something that's often necessary, um, especially with grow facilities, um, chewing up a huge amount of electricity. Uh, so it's very important to make sure that the load calculations, the one line, um, any panel upgrades um, are appropriately uh, documented for both review uh, and, of course, inspection during construction. On the mechanical and plumbing side of the review, um, and you'll see that this is shared on the architectural side as well, the number of plumbing fixtures often comes into question. <clears throat> the occupant load factor from a architectural and plumbing code compliance perspective via policy in the city and county of Denver is permitted to be one per 300. Um, which is a bit relaxed from uh, what one could interpret in the building code for an F1 occupancy, which is how grow facilities are defined. Um, so that is in recognition of the fact that the density within the grow portion itself, grow rooms, bedrooms, um, those areas outside the business operation um, really have a very low occupant load. And recognizing that, we're not going to ask you to put in a great number of plumbing fixtures. In addition, on the mechanical side, um, the ventilation, there are minimum mechanical code requirements for ventilation, again, based on uh, occupant load. Um, and again, that 1 per 300 comes into play and is relevant to make sure that um, we're not forcing you to provide more ventilation than is really necessary. Um, Occasionally, that can conflict with some of the CO2 enrichment concepts, um, the ventilation um, requirement versus the need to enrich the environment. Um, and those special cases are evaluated both by our mechanical plan review team and by fire department, um, kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, because each facility is unique in that regard. Both extraction facilities and CO2 enrichment uh, are, um, I would say, more, more well-defined from a regulatory perspective uh, on our um, fire department or fire code side of the review, um, and they'll speak to that a little bit here in a few minutes. Um, the uh, extraction facilities can uh, often lead to uh, class one, div one requirements, and the extraction facility exhaust does need to be provided with compliant uh, mechanical code um, design. Finally, there's one other item that's listed here under mechanical and plumbing. Um, although it's an environmental health requirement, uh, there is an odor control, um, it was an ordinance, I believe. Yeah, so the, the odor control ordinance uh, doesn't come out of the mechanical code. That being said, if modifications to the systems or new systems are required in order to meet uh, the ordinance requirements for air control, you still need to go through our mechanical plan review and permitting section in order to obtain the appropriate permits to modify or install those mechanical elements. On the architectural and structural side, the uh, plumbing fixtures, again, as I noted, uh, one per 300 occupant load factor is a relevant reduction. And uh, accessibility is required uh, if there's a change of occupancy. Uh, if it's a new building, um, then we need to make sure that accessibility is provided more from an access perspective on the site, in the building, and then bathroom facilities. Uh, there's no exceptions for marijuana-related design with respect to accessibility, so that needs to be shown on the architectural plans. Means of egress, uh, something that comes up from time to time is problematic, uh, especially in the grow facilities where security, the need for security is very high, um, but that doesn't mean that you can uh, block up or lock down all of the doors. Um, there are security uh, measures available um, without having to completely lock down a facility so that appropriate and code compliant means of egress are maintained and the ability for fire department to access the building from the outside is also maintained. And finally, one of the issues that we see frequently on the uh, architectural side is existing buildings being converted with number of offices, uh, a processing areas, and things like that where you actually end up with an, uh, what I'll call a, a relatively high occupant load, maybe in a 30 to 50 range by calculation. And if the building is non-sprinklered, 
then the corridors that are within that space may need to be fire rated. And that can be challenging, um, but it is a code requirement with respect to uh, all the corridors that are serving those areas, those rooms. And um, if your walls don't go full height, um, or if you don't have rated doors within these corridors, then that's something that absolutely has to be addressed. And there can be some expense associated with that if it's something that wasn't considered from the beginning. So we've been developing or perhaps redeveloping uh, the occupancy classification policy around um, marijuana facilities for about a year. I think uh, we finally got it dialed in now um, from a clarity perspective. And it doesn't so much affect the grow portion uh, as much as it does the sales or business operation side. Historically, we had defined the sales areas as Group B occupancies. And this was related to the fact that uh, in Colorado, originally, it was only a medical marijuana sales that existed. And from our perspective, uh, on the regulatory side, that was uh, more functional, uh, or I'm sorry, m more related to the function of a professional practice. Um, you kind of, you needed a doctor's note to get your prescription. Um, and so we classified those as a Group B occupancy. Obviously, things have changed. We have recreational. And going forward, we will be classifying all of these facilities that are used for sales, regardless of whether it's a marijuana product itself or if there are other elements associated with a sale, as Group M occupancies. You'll see on the screen that there's a few other designations, uh, for example, testing facilities, so labs. Those would typically be a Group B occupancy. And what I will mention, one more thing about this slide, is that the, uh, the policy that we've uh, developed around, uh, or that, that is behind the bullets on the slide, uh, has some specific criteria about when a change of occupancy is or is not required. Um, I'm sorry? Right. Yeah, so um, Scott will mention that. <laughs> And that's that. All right, so Scott will come up to talk about the change of occupancy. Thanks, Eric. Um, so as Eric, Eric had mentioned, the, um, um, the policy that we created, it, it was really a, a, a big change just because in 2009, we, we didn't have the recreational component, so the, the be use uh, just made more sense. It was like a doctor's office, a, a, a clinic, than than an M use. And now that now that we have the uh, the recreational component, um, Jill and I were when we were drafting this this policy, uh, we we thought it was a good idea to reach out to uh, some of the industry leaders and and develop a better rapport and and get their feedback on on how they perceive our policy. So prior to to writing or finalizing our policy. We actually went on a number of tours. I think we went on four or five different um, uh, dispensaries to go see and get a feel. What are they really like? What What's happening? Should they be B? Should they be M? Um, and I think that the, the, the big thing, the shift that occurred during these meetings, and we had a couple meetings before the site visits and then a couple meetings after the site visits, um, we really started to develop a better rapport with the industry leaders. Um, and I think when this first came out, uh, a lot of the folks that were doing dispensaries and grows and whatnot would come in for zoning, might not realize they need building. Um, and then when they need building, they were really upset because they, they, all the, they didn't realize the financial impact. So there was a real rub between the industry and, and, and sort of CPD be, because of, of maybe expectations or the understanding of what was required uh, was different because this is a, sort of a new group of folks uh, getting into a construction industry as well as a new a new industry and and I think this policy helped sort of uh, really help mend some of maybe the the rub that had been created uh, because of the maybe the non understanding of our requirements and and um, and and what their sort of expectations were and what our expectations were, they were, they were a little disparate. And, and this really, I think, helped uh, mend a, or, or bridge a gap that was there. 
And I think it was really well received afterwards. And, and the final resolution of this, this policy was that if you're, if you're in any way renovating up to 50% of your, your, uh, your building, whether it's a combination of a, a, um, a grow and a dispensary, or you're just doing a renovation to your dispensary, if, if it's a 50% mark, you're meeting that threshold, at that point, we're gonna want a change of use to happen. Uh, and, and they got it, they understood why. We, we went through the definitions of what's the difference between a business use to retail use and why. And, and if you go into any dispensary today in Denver, it looks like a retail store. It doesn't look like a doctor's office or a clinic. And, and that was the primary reason why uh, we made that change. Um, and, and everyone was in alignment with that at the end of the day. So I, I really believe this policy did a lot more than just the, the policy criteria. Um, and, and we learned a lot through the process. And I think reaching out to the industry leaders uh, early on, probably a lesson learned for us, we probably could have, have, have done more of that early on to alleviate some of the, the sort of uh, rub that was happening when, when people would come in for permits. Um, I'm gonna skip over the slides so we don't have to go up and down again. I'm gonna just talk briefly about uh, greenhouses and um, I'm real passionate about uh, the IECC and high performance design and sustainability, and, and Jill is as well. And it's, it was refreshing to us to see that in 09, we, we, we had a greenhouse come in and it was approved and it was, I think, 80,000 square feet. And we're like, you know, this is really, really a good thing. And then uh, we adopted the 2015 codes, the I-Series, and that includes the IECC, and it makes it tough for a greenhouse. And it makes it tough for some of the, the grow facilities to maybe be as sustainable as we'd like. So fortunately, we had a couple come in. One was not able to get permitted, um, and the criteria that we were using for the greenhouse is that if you could um, show a comparison, an energy comparison, to a model uh, uh, warehouse facility and what the energy consumption, the annual energy consumption would be in Denver for, for that use in a warehouse, that same use, same square footage, and then compare that to a greenhouse for an annual energy consumption. And if, it's, if it comes up less, you could show that, that factor to the model uh, building, uh, we would approve that. And we're, I think we're close to getting a large facility that's a combination warehouse and greenhouse approved at this point. So we're excited about that. And we'd love to hear if you have stories where you've been able to approve uh, greenhouses or other sustainable approaches, because this is something that I think is important. We're talking about a significant number of businesses I think there's close to 600 uh, licenses at this point. We're talking about a lot of square footage, a lot of energy consumption. I know the LED light manufacturers have come uh, part of the way there with different light configuration and color configuration and Kelvin uh, to help, but it's, not, it's nowhere near some of the other light, the output, and I know that really impacts, I guess, the quality of the product. So, but I'm, I'm really hopeful. This is a huge industry and it's getting bigger as each state comes on board. Uh, that the LED manufacturers are going to step up the pace and get even with the, the lighting output. And, and I'm sure they can get there with the right amount of research and development. So if you have any interesting stories with regard to energy and uh, high performance design that have been successful, we would love to hear them so that we can promote them here in Denver. Uh, and I'll turn back a slide so Jill can talk about some of the other issues today. Okay, so just a couple quick things to highlight. So Denver Fire will talk um, quite a bit about extraction, but as I noted initially at the beginning, you know, we in Denver have continued to see the extraction market um, grow and get bigger in terms of the types of extraction they're doing, the amount of extraction, and then what they're actually doing with that product. Um, we're having an interesting conversation right now within our land use department about this in terms of um, what people are actually doing with the extract. Are they putting it in lotion? Are they making that lotion? Because um, in addition to just the extraction and, and what type of extraction they're doing, what they're doing with that extracted oil also may make a difference from a land use perspective that I'm not sure we fully thought out. So I will say, um, as I visit more facilities, more questions typically tend to come up that I, I often feel like, wow, I haven't thought about that yet. I wonder how we're gonna deal with that from a land use perspective. And of course, with zoning, it's kind of hard to make changes to that because once you get your zoning permit that, and you've established the use appropriately, that use runs with the land. And it's hard to make changes to that after the fact because you just end up creating 
essentially non-conforming uses, and those non-conforming uses don't ever want to go away. Uh, so that continues to be something we struggle with. As Scott noted, the LED lighting, I was on a, a panel with a, a conference of planning professors on Friday and heard from one of our larger um, real estate brokers in town that works and, and leases to marijuana businesses that they're seeing facilities consuming roughly $12 a square foot um, of, of energy uh, from Excel, which is pretty huge when you consider a typical light industry is one to $2 a square foot in energy cost. So that sustainability piece is really key. And, and the greenhouse piece is really fascinating. We've gotten lots and lots of questions primarily from journalists, I think, about why aren't we seeing more greenhouses in Denver. Um, and so Scott kind of talked about some of the challenges with our new code. But you know, we also know that there's, because there is such a demand, um, the grow facilities are growing constantly. And so even in a greenhouse, they're still using lights. And so that's another challenge. Um, one, a couple last things, we continue to see some unsafe conditions and work being done without permits. Um, even in our licensed facilities, that continues to be an issue. So in a meeting with uh, some of the industry representatives about a week ago, um, I've committed, so now I've got to find time to do it, to actually leading a presentation with the industry to talk more and get into more details about what requires permits, what do they need, and why. Um, we Something Scott and I are really passionate about, and. Uh, I think we've done them for two years now, more sort of general commercial permitting um, presentations that we open up to the general public to try to help our customers be more prepared when they come in. And I don't think we've really seen folks from the marijuana industry at those presentations. And so we're gonna do one specifically for marijuana, um, partner with Denver Fire, and really dive into some more detailed issues. We tend to be in their business a lot, um, more than other businesses, and that's because through the licensing process, um, licensing allows transfers of owners and uh, also modification of premises, and they're doing a lot of those all the time. So a number of our inspectors feel like they're at these businesses um, you know, every month, every couple, you know, couple times a year, which is un uh, not typical for us with other businesses in Denver. And so we see more. I'm sure there's probably similar compliance issues in other industries. We're just not there and witnessing and seeing it as much. And then as Scott noted, you know, we, we very much, and this permitting presentation is a part of that, um, working with the industry is really important. I feel like they are growing and changing so quickly that it is really helpful for us to learn and understand what's next what's working so that we're better prepared because I feel like more often than not we're reactive instead of proactive um, with this industry. And then not on the slide, but one quick thing I'll note that we've struggled with in Denver are unlicensed grow facilities um, that happen in industrial buildings as well as in residential homes. Um, we have quite a few instances where we've had houses rented out. Um, by folks that aren't necessarily living there and they're just growing marijuana that's going onto the black market. Um, so much so that we've had people come in and try to get separate electrical services for a detached garage. And they're actually renting out the garage to someone different than living in the house, which poses a number of issues. Um, it is illegal. Um, and so we actually wrote an amendment in the, our 2016 Denver Building and Fire Code to the IRC, I think it's chapter 36, on number of electrical services, because we didn't feel like we had clear code guidance to um, limit the number of services one single family house could have. And that was really done in partnership with Denver Fire. Um, so it continues to be an um, interesting industry, and we continue to learn a lot, but that partnering with them I think is really helpful. Um, because for the, I would say, um, for the most part, the, the licensed industry really wants to be compliant with the rules and really wants to understand what we're seeking as well. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Denver Fire. Okay, so um, hello again. I'm Nicole Skolmo. I'm the Operations Supervisor um, for Denver Fire in the Fire Prevention Division. And um, 
like everyone has said today, welcome to Denver and thank you for coming to the symposium. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I know that it's a long day and at this point you're probably overloaded on marijuana information. Um, I know I just about am, so bear with us just a little bit more and we'll try to um, keep it rolling for you. So one thing um, that Mark and I were talking about when we were getting ready for the presentation, as we were saying, it's been about three years um, of doing this symposium now. This is the third year. And we decided to take a little bit of a different approach with our presentation. Um, first of all, looking at all of you and legalization coming to you, we figured that we would talk about some of our lessons learned and then also talk about the things we did right, some things we did wrong, um, and then take a look at you know not only where have we come from, but where we're going for the future. Um, secondly, our fire protection engineer who does most of our um, engineering reviews for the marijuana facilities is on vacation in Italy on his honeymoon. So we're not going to get too technical today, but um, all of our technical presentations that we've done in the past um, for the symposiums are on the symposium website. So you can certainly review those. Um, but like I said, we're going to kind of go rogue and mix it up just a little bit today. Um, hopefully that helps you though, like I said, in taking a look at your processes and um, how you're developing. And um, I'm going to bring Mark up in just a second here. Mark is one of our inspectors. We have a group of four inspectors. We have a lieutenant and then we report to the assistant chief. Um, I do most of our kind of front and back end coordinating and then also I act as our um, liaison working with the other agencies and some of the other departments um, to make sure that we're all getting what we need to done. Um, I'll just also recognize in the audience we have another one of our inspectors in the back, um, Ray Burden. He's another resident expert. And then we have um, our fire protection engineer, J.D. Lands, who's filling in for Brian while he's on his honeymoon. And then also um, we have our division chief, uh, Chief Al McGarry, came to uh, heckle us and watch our presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. And um, he wanted me to note that this presentation is a reflection of why he has gray hair now after working in marijuana for so long. <laughs> we were, we were going to leave that part off. Um, so uh, thank you for being here, uh, of course. And I, while I was sitting here, I was thinking, um, you know, we, we go over and over again about this uh, collaborative approach. And I think this is a great example. Uh, everybody that's that's spoken today that from Denver, and <clears throat> are people that I I can call. Uh, I know first name basis. Uh, Scott. I don't think Scott's taking my phone calls anymore, <laughs> but he's dealing with some of my issues. But um, that's a good example of collaboration right there. Is is there's there? I'm just a low level inspector, but I can call a lot of these very important people. Uh, at any time and ask for guidance, and I think that would be the the essence of our compliant uh, our collaboration right there. So um, I, I really appreciate everybody's help because it gets confusing out there. So anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, so looking back, um, this was not an easy process. Uh, we didn't get here um, just you know because we knew what we were doing. Uh, so. A little background, and so in, in 2010 to 2013, it was this uh, the the industry wasn't very well regulated. Uh, if they came in and got past zoning, um, then they would uh, get their change of use, and normally those inspections would just revert back to the firehouse. So uh, the flammables group, if they happened to be in on there, because we're we're broken down by specialty. Um, and we didn't have a marijuana group back then. So the flammables group would, would come in on a lot of these places that used to have propane for their forklifts. And one of the big things during this time was uh, we had a lot of constitutional issues. So we'd go in and tell somebody, um, no, you're wrong. You've got to go back to the building department and, and get this uh, approved. And uh, the first uh, point to be made would be that, well, you're violating my constitutional rights. And, and uh, so that was, that was, that was our uh, big issue back then. So we also, uh, 
really didn't know what was going on in there. Uh, we were we were learning uh, as we were going, and uh, learning by failures. Uh, that that picture in the center there with the the, the big black blob there is just uh, plastic that was uh, previously attached to the ceiling. And uh, one of our inspectors explained it pretty well to uh, to 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 these operators here was uh, you don't want to end up getting shrink wrapped. So. Uh, that that tend to carry a lot more weight when than the way I was going to put it was uh, it's wrong. So um, <laughs> they, you know, they it it you got to know your audience. So um, so that that was back then um, in 2013 to 2014. Um, we, we were doing better with our compliance. We we're uh, bringing people back in to get their finish off their permitting process. And so we got a lot of this, uh, I've got my license, what's your problem? Well, <clears throat> it doesn't just end there. We come back, you're going to see our smiling faces every year. Fire department does annual inspections. And uh, so you're stuck with us. And we're going to make sure that what everybody has put effort into getting you, reaching, getting you to this uh, level of compliance, my job as an inspector is to make sure you stay there. So below we had some of those grow pods there and uh, we had a lot of electrical issues associated with that. Um, so we also had a lot of uh, problems with the uh, expanding uh, caregiver grows, where cooperative grows, where a lot of people would just gather and make one big grow out of it. And uh, again, that wasn't very well regulated in, in, in their eyes, so they didn't have to do much. Um, just it, what to them translated, well, the state's not regulating me, why are you regulating me? And that was, uh, and so I'm, I'm regulating the, the building and the processes inside of it, I'm not regulating your plants. So <clears throat> we, uh, so that was our, our ongoing process in the, the, that upper picture is one of our examples of it's pretty easy to spot a marijuana facility by the melted uh, electrical service. I'm no electrician, but I knew that was bad. So in, in 2014 to 2016, um, and, and these are all just my personal observations over time where uh, I would hear the same, you know, hear this a lot. And uh, it, that, was, that was my uh, catchphrase back then, was, oh, I thought that was okay. And uh, we have, a, obviously, a butane hash oil explosion that was being, we, it, was, it was being done safe, it was outside. Um, but the end result was the same. And kind of a little nice picture there to show you that some of the force of that, uh, uh, those butane uh, cans that, that cook off. Uh, it's embedded in the fence. There's a, there was another picture I couldn't find where the perfect imprint of uh, a but, uh, one of those butane cans was uh, pressed into a piece of uh, uh, floor joist that was near it. So um, just kind of a, our uh, things to watch out for. And all, just in case you were wondering, all these pictures are, are, are bad things. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't find any good examples. I don't take... So, uh, so uh, what really helped us out in 2014, 2016 is we got that home hash oil uh, ordinance, which didn't necessarily affect our enforcement. Um, it was now we had the assistance of the police department. Now it was no longer just a code violation, but it was also a uh, municipal violation of the the, the statute. So. Um, that was nice. The, the police took over a lot of our headache there. Um, we still go out, but um, we weren't the sole uh, agency trying to correct that. So that, that was very helpful. So that brings us 2016 to 2017. And uh, my little caption there was, uh, sorry, no one is home. So that was uh, the next attempt at uh, avoiding compliance or putting off compliance. Um, the idea was, well, if nobody answers the door, uh, the fire department will go away and uh, we can continue. So um, Ray had a, some people that he knocked on the front door and then they, they did the old uh, Bo and Luke Duke uh, sliding over the hood of the car out the back and taking off. So 
<clears throat> we asked uh, our associates with excise and license to to take action against them, and that was uh, that pretty well curtailed that after a while because people found out that a not only did we not appreciate not being allowed in, but also the excise and license uh, considered that a violation against their license. So. Um, that was helpful, and again, this is a good example of how cooperation is important. Um, this is a good picture. It's not a, a commercial building. This is a home. It's a, a small brick uh, North Denver home, and I thought I'd just include that as a good example of what seven pounds of butane can do. Um, that's about 20 feet of brick wall that was uh, blown out and uh, launched into the neighbor's house. Um, we it didn't get torn down. Surprisingly, they 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 chose to rebuild it. But um, that the dryer in the lower left-hand corner there is the approximately the ignition source. It was a back laundry room. That's where the extraction uh, machines were, and one of them was leaking, and uh, the operator ran out, and soon out and the, the butane followed him out. Found an, found that ignition source and then blew out that bedroom wall that went toward the front of the building. So, um, on, ongoing issues. And uh, so this year, 2017, seems to be the year of, yeah, well, I'll call your boss. And uh, unfortunately, Chief Almagary, Chief V, he'll have been getting a lot of calls um, <clears throat> where uh, they don't necessarily agree with my enforcement. So uh, they try to make traction by calling and, and, and explaining that they, they don't feel that I'm being fair. So in this, in this instance, we had a, an extraction room that's pictured on the right, and our uh, meters were going off. Uh, they were above 71%. It's, it's alarming right there. It says 71% of the explosive limit. Uh, it was actually higher than that. We had a picture of an 83, so that was that was wrong. And also, their their door was open, so um, their response to that was, "Well, we'll just extract at night." And uh, so, so we took that as an open invitation to stop by later that night. Sure enough, they were still extracting. So um, this is the kind of things that, uh, as enforcers, uh, keep in mind that. Um, you're going to have to deal with this ever-changing attitude toward re toward your regulations, and you're going to have to modify your regulations accordingly. So, um, oh, thank goodness, it's now it's now it's Nicole's turn. So, um, Nicole, come on up here. Thanks, Mark, for taking us on that um, fun trip down memory lane. So again, that's kind of where we've been. And a couple of the things that I was just going to talk about now are um, where we're at and where we're going. So one thing that I know um, a lot of the other groups and agencies have talked about today is the constant innovation in the marijuana group or marijuana industry. So if you haven't experienced it yet, um, just get ready. It will keep you on your toes. They are always coming up with something new. I have to hand it to them. It's like there's not a day that I don't get a phone call where they say, you know, someone says, well, I'm thinking about doing you know, and it's just something totally crazy off the wall and you're like, okay, let's see if we can do that or not or are you already doing it? A lot of times they're already doing it. Um, that kind of brings me to my point there is um, just be careful. We're still dealing with a lot of unpermitted construction. So with that innovation comes a lot of um, impatience. So frequently they will have already brought in machines and then they come in, come to us and say, well, we're doing this kind of extraction now. Um, what do you think? Or again, as Mark mentioned before, um, I thought that was okay. Uh, there's a lot um, that we're still learning. We're meeting with them, you know, trying to work hand in hand to develop our codes and policies so that we can let them do what they want to do. Um, the unpermitted work is definitely a challenge, though. Um, as I mentioned previously, or has been mentioned in other presentations, the compliance inspectors are in the facility twice a year. Um, that's different than our other commercial occupancies, which would only be inspected once a year. Um, what we've found through those inspections is that there are high non-compliance rates. And so basically instead of sending um, 
a reinspect, or uh, going on a reinspect at every single facility. We just say everyone's getting two a year, period. And that's been what has worked for us. Um, we still have you know, high rates of non-compliance, but um, we're working through those issues with them. Again, kind of hand in hand, figuring out what it is that they're doing, what do they want to do, um, and then just making sure that they're getting permits and doing it in a safe manner. Um, another issue that we have dealt with, especially over the last year um, in particular, has been issuance of temporary permits and then also um, retroactive compliance. So if I could give one piece of advice um, or maybe point out one thing that I think we could have done differently, it would have been um, not going for retroactive compliance. <laughs> it's very, very difficult um, once they're already doing things to try to pull it back in. So imagine that many of you have already heard of or know about um, the closed loop systems and kind of the situation that we were dealing with in Denver where we realized they weren't truly closed loop systems. So what that means is when they're doing the extraction with LPG, the intent is that the system um, recaptures all of the butane or whatever solvent it is that they're using and that there's no release. Well, when we had um, put those requirements in place, we did plan reviews, we issued permits, everything seemed all good. Um, our inspectors started going out. They noticed that there was, in fact, you know, some butane. Um, they were opening up the machines early, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and say, well, what are we going to do about this now? So that brought us to um, some code updates and retroactive requirements, which we refer to as the Class 1, Division 1 requirements or the 2016 Denver Fire Code um, updates. What that has required from these facilities is things like um, doors swinging in the direction of egress. We've required upgraded um, exhaust and ventilation. There's suppression requirements in the extraction rooms and things like that. So to my point of um, retro compliance requirements, we've been basically chasing these facilities around for the last two years, um, trying to make sure that they get into compliance. Um, based on some pressure in the industry or, you know, from the industry. And then also, um, you know, our willingness to work with them. We've issued a lot of temporary permits and that has been challenging um, to kind of, you know, bring those back and close that gap um, based on, or close that gap of, you know, compliance versus non-compliance versus somewhere in the middle or some combination of that. Um, so just something to think about, you know, when you put your requirements in place, um, it's definitely easier to kind of take a stronger stance um, versus try to pull it back later. Just um, Another thing is um, taking a look at our inspection schedules, um, some of the statistics that we're collecting, um, justifications, um, by that I mean, you know, justifications for positions, justifications for expansions of groups. Um, as I mentioned before, in fire prevention, we're just one of the specialty groups. So we have other groups such as, you know, flammables and high-rise and institutions. Um, and our group of the four inspectors and lieutenant um, handle all of the marijuana inspections. We handle all of the permits, and that can get to be quite a lot. So looking at now kind of our inspection schedules as far as how many times are we in those facilities? Um, not only the marijuana group, but the license sign-off group, the certificate of occupancy sign-off group, um, the life safety systems testing, you know, who's in these facilities, how often are they there? Um, we're talking a lot about doing more combined inspections, um, doing cross-training even amongst just our groups, um, and then in addition doing cross-training with the other inspection um, agencies. We did a major inspector training a few years ago, and I know that we're looking at revamping that program and kind of doing that again so that if one inspector is coming out, they can perhaps take care of multiple things. Um, the industry, they definitely love to see us in their facilities, but maybe we could cut that back just a little bit so we can get our work done more efficiently. Um, statistics and data, I know that um, this has been brought up many, many times in a lot of the other um, presentations, but Anyone, anyone and everyone is going to want to know about marijuana. Um, they're going to want to know everything there is to know about it. And then every person who asks you is going to ask you a different way and for some sort of a different form of the same information. So just get prepared to track everything, track everything, and then track some more stuff. Um, and however you think you're going to present that, just be prepared to manipulate it and give it in a different way. Um, we get so overwhelmed with requests for numbers and data. It's really, it's quite a beast. Um, so we're actually looking at, you know, our databases and what we use um, and can we be doing things better? Can we use different systems? Um, not only that, related to the data piece, um, just be cautious of 
whose data lives where and how does that data talk to each other. So the building department uses a different system. Um, they're very kind and let us have access to that. But then that just means, you know, we have more inspectors in different systems that they don't know. So that's a consideration to make. Um, the other piece of that is something that's important for us is addressing is a huge challenge, you know. So you've heard the number thrown out about the number of licenses, the number of unique um, locations, which excise and license refers to. And then the fire department, we come in and we say, well, we're using occupancies. So take that. And it's a completely different um, you know, way of speaking about the same facilities, the same places, the same physical locations. So just things to think about. Um, there's a lot of tracking. There's a lot of requirements. So just get, um, get your ducks in a row. Get prepared as soon as you can. Um, another piece that we're really looking at right now, and this is really kind of in my house, actually, is taking a look at our processes and our policies. Um, so a lot of our other specialized groups don't maybe have as much interaction with some of their um, occupancies that they go out and deal with. So let's say I'm a flammables inspector or a high rise. I'm just going to go out, do my inspection, and I'm pretty much done. The marijuana group, we're going out there multiple times. We're doing multiple inspections. Um, we're issuing operational permits. Sometimes we're issuing multiple operational permits. Um, these have to be renewed annually. It's kind of a clunky process. We're asking for the same information over and over and over again. Um, and a lot of times, there's a lot of change in these facilities. So there's changes um, of their staff. There's changes of compliance officers. There's changes for what kind of licenses they have versus what they had last year. They're adding processes. Um, they're adding CO2 enrichment. They're taking CO2 enrichment out. They're updating the pesticides that they're using. So. One thing that we need to do at this point, you know, seven years in, is take a look at our policies and how we do business and make sure that for this industry it really makes sense. Um, there's a lot of things that if I had a lot more time, I probably would already be done with, but I, you know, we're working on trying to get there and making sure that, again, we kind of make sense what we need and what we're doing for what they need and what they want to do. Um, one challenge for the inspectors um, in particular is this idea of verifying their um, SOPs and their maintenance requirements for things like their equipment. So in a lot of other industries, there are going to be other um, agencies or other um, governing jurisdictions that deal with this. So there's going to be you know, listings. There's going to be um, manufacturers. There's going to be contractors who come in and deal with training these employees on how to use equipment. Um, they're going to deal with the maintenance schedules and keeping those logs and records for um, you know, whatever type of equipment that they're using, you know, gas pumps or this or that. Um, in the marijuana industry, it's a whole new ball game. So everything that they're using is, you know, proprietary or it's custom built for them or we haven't seen it before. Um, and then also we deal with the issue of um, contractors who may or may not want to work with them. We have um, contractors in some situations who They'll drop the product off and you know take the check, but then they're gone. They don't um, you know pull the required permits, or they maybe don't handhold as much as they would in other industries. So what the inspectors are kind of dealing with, and what we're trying to figure out um, where we fit in is where is our role with verifying and training the industry, helping them develop their um, you know standard operating procedures, and then as far as the maintenance, um, you know when is it our responsibility to check that? When do we look at? You know, that's kind of your responsibility, but it's a safety concern. Um, so that's just something that we're working through little by little. Um, but it has been a challenge for sure. Um, kind of leading into that also is now, again, we're seven years into some of these facilities being in operation. Um, the life cycle on some of this equipment is something that we hadn't necessarily considered. So things are wearing out, parts are wearing out, they want to use new um, you know, processes or equipment. Um, what happens to the old equipment? Do they sell it? Do they get rid of it? Do they take it to their house? Um, do they give it to a friend and just say, I don't know what happened to it? Um, and again, whose responsibility is that? Our permit kind of stops um, once it's either expired, uh, revoked, or voided. Um, but as far as where that equipment goes after our permit is done, um, that, that was something that we didn't really think about. So it's a challenge that we've kind of realized we may need to deal with now. Um, and again, it's a little bit different than some of the other industries. So. A lot of other industries are going to have contractors who are responsible for that equipment. You know, they're going to come pick up that tank um, or they're going to come pick up, you know, whatever it is that they were using because they're going to take it back. A lot of this is not the case with the marijuana industry. So just something that um, everyone's kind of trying to say, like, are you responsible for that? Who's doing that? Are we doing that? No, I don't want it, you know, or what have you. So 
Um, something to think about as you're developing, again, your policies. Um, as uh, Jill kind of mentioned before, um, outreach and education is a huge piece for everyone, um, all the agencies in Denver who are avail involved with marijuana. Um, we're trying our best to give as much information about what these facilities need to do to operate. Um, we're trying to provide you know, code information, guidebooks, checklists, um, quick start user guides, you know, all these kind of things. Um, but there's a lot. There's a lot of information. There's a lot that they need to do. Um, and sometimes for us, it's actually just a resource issue. You know, we're, we have inspections, we have permits, and then we also need to be um, doing these workshops or, you know, sending information as much as we can, doing one-on-one -on -one conferencing. So it's just kind of a challenge, but um, we definitely want to provide that information as much as possible. So developing more things like this, um, you know, having other smaller symposiums, having um, you know, two or three agencies get together and provide information to the industry, I think is going to be really helpful for the next few years, just making sure that everyone has the information that they need to be compliant and operate safely. Um, code updates and committees. Um, again, as I mentioned, um, one of our fire protection engineers, he's really um, been just amazing in, you know, getting some of these codes developed. Um, I know that he sat on one of the NFA, uh, NFPA committees um, to get some of these standards developed nationally. Um, code updates are one thing, though, that, you know, you're already behind by the time you think about updating them. So right now we're, um, we're under the 2015 IFC with the um, Denver amendments. And by the time that we get around to thinking about it, we're already going to be in the next code cycle, you know. So just keep that in mind that codes take a long time to develop. Um, and also for marijuana, if you haven't adopted, you know, some of the Denver codes, you'll have to adopt your own. So um, just think about developing those because that is quite time consuming. Um, communication, I think it goes without saying. Internal and external, um, it's very challenging. We're always thinking about, you know, the who, what, when, what do we need to tell people, when do we need to do it. Um, very quick moving communication, as we've stressed here today. Um, that collaboration, just knowing who to pick up um, the phone and call. Uh, typically our inspectors are texting all day. They're texting me, they're texting the building guys, they're te texting the electrical inspectors, the police. Um, it just happens so quickly and so sometimes it's hard to track that and kind of bring it back. You know, we have an issue and the chief will come and say, well, what happened there? And you're flipping through your texts, you're looking through your emails, you're trying to remember who did you talk to, who was there. So there's just a lot of communication that needs to happen and sometimes it's just so fast moving, it's really hard to get a handle on. Um, another thing that we're looking at right now is reviewing kind of some of the overlap. You've probably heard a lot of repeat information today as you've sat in the different sessions. So we'll refer to pesticides and you'll have environmental health talking about it, you'll have me talking about it, you'll have um, Department of Agriculture talking about it, you'll have MED talking about it. So one thing that we've started looking at, at least from Denver Fire perspective, is um, are we doing anything that we don't need to be doing? Is someone else already doing it? Um, is somebody covering our requirements somewhere else? Because if they are, we're happy to say thank you so much. And, you know, we really appreciate you doing that for us. Um, conversely, if someone is not doing something, we're also trying to make sure and figure that out now too. I know that you all probably have seen that rule book passed around. You know, there's just pages and pages of rules. And sometimes it's hard to even remember, um, even for me, you know, who is responsible for that? Whose rule is that? I know I've heard that somewhere. Um, so just making sure that we're reviewing the overlap and checking in and seeing who's doing what. Are they still doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, and then the last uh, kind of two points here, I can tie these together, but these are some of the things that are really right now um, priority number one, two, three, four, five, whatever they are, on our radar. So these are things that we are dealing with. We're getting ready for. Um, they're right in our face right now. So the political sensitivity, I'm sure as you can imagine, um, the industry has really started to gain a lot of traction. Um, they have a lot of industry groups. Um, they have a lot of, um, you know, representation at our um, state level, trying to get laws changed, um, trying to change requirements and do different things. So a lot of times, um, like Mark mentioned before, you know, we'll be out at a facility and the owner or manager will tell us, well, I'll call your boss. And the next thing you know, you know, the chief is coming down and saying, excuse me, Nicole, why is the mayor calling me? Um, you're in big trouble now, you know, or 
Whereas Mark, he's in big trouble now. That's usually the case. Um, but so, you know, just considering that political sensitivity, um, again, these issues become very, very big very, very quickly. A huge reason for that is the money that's involved. You know, when we put a facility, when we put a stop work order, um, say, for the extraction processes, if we shut them down, they can be losing, you know, thousands of dollars an hour, probably more than that. Um, so the issues become very, very elevated very, very quickly. Um, social consumption. Thank you for being here because you could be hearing about social consumption. Um, social consumption is the big, big deal in Denver right now. Um, the ordinance has passed and like everything else we've said about marijuana, um, the voters voted for it. So it's here. We're going to deal with it. Um, from our perspective, we're kind of looking at which of our inspectors need to be going into these facilities? How often should they be going? Um, what are they looking for when they get in there? Another um, consideration that we're making is for first responders, you know, what kind of protection are they going to need in addition to what they would normally have um, if they're going into a place where people are smoking? You know, are we going to have a bunch of, um, or are a bunch of my firefighters going to get in trouble because they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I, you know, inhaled a bunch of smoke or what have you. So just kind of looking at some of those things, um, again, with the license sign-offs, we're trying to just put together that checklist of what are we looking for? If it's going to be a yoga studio where they're going to have vaping, I don't, do we care? What's our role? What are we looking for? Um, you know, and just making sure that we're getting ready for that because it's coming. Uh, it's here. It's not coming. It's here. Um, special events is a huge piece also with the um, social consumption. Uh, I think, you know, as, as we've talked about, we just don't know what that's going to look like. You know, as, same for so much else with marijuana. Um, so we're kind of waiting to see um, what are they going to bring to us. And again, just like everything else, we'll, we'll walk hand in hand with them and figure it out one way or the other. Um, and then, again, as has been mentioned multiple times today, um, the hemp challenge. So for us, you know, our processes are still the same. We're kind of bound on some of our things um, basically by, like, for example, the extraction permits. We can only issue an extraction permit to a licensed marijuana facility. A licensed marijuana facility can't extract hemp. So it's almost like we're caught in this catch-22, you know, I hate to say it, kind of red tape sort of situation. So this is one thing that we're kind of waiting for um, direction, and we'll see what happens. So. If you come back next year, hopefully these things will be on our, you know, checked off list and we'll have some new um, to-dos to present to you. So um, with that, I am done. And I think the next slide is, yeah, questions. So um, I'll open it up to everyone, please, if you have questions. I, I might just add one thing real quick since I completely forgot on my slide since Nicole brought up social consumption. So from a zoning and building perspective, it's it's also um, an interesting challenge for us to figure out. Um, the ordinance or the initiative was actually written specifically to say that if it was a brick and mortar um, designated consumption area that they didn't have to get a special zoning permit for the consumption area. Um, and then within the rules and regs related to brick and mortar locations, we are requiring that someone submitting for a license application to create a social consumption area provide their certificate of occupancy for their underlying use. Um, so Nicole noted it's, it's here. We don't have any locations yet, but what we are hearing from our friends at Excise, from customers who want to do this, is they have no underlying use. They have no current location, and how do we deal with them? Um, and so that's a struggle we're trying to figure out right now, especially from a, a zoning and building occupancy perspective that I don't know that we have necessarily figured out yet. Um, but should you head down this way, that, that may also be a challenge, because to us it feels like that's really skirting the intent of the initiative, which was to allow for consumption within an already existing business. So with that, sorry, we'll go to questions. Yes, I just want to give a shout out to you all, to the city of Denver, for uh, the uh, heavy lifting you've done in this area. I've been involved with local development land, reg land development regulation in Florida for about 30 years, and I have no illusions as to the amount of work this has been and how much cooperation it took. But I do have one question. It, uh, speaking with our building official behind me over there, I'm from Gainesville as well, John Freeland. We were, we were thinking, my God, what about a smaller community? And so it raises the question of, does a community in Colorado have the option to opt out of doing any of this? Or is it, because I don't think every, not many communities could do, could do what you all are doing, so. so. So I'm not an attorney, I can't, I don't know if Marley's here, but yes, my understanding is you can opt out. And a number of Colorado communities have opted out and have no marijuana. 
um, so in a certain, locations. Say a given county or a given city, they'd say, no, it's not legal in this county or this city. Or how does, am I? Am yes. I, yeah, so in Denver, when the voters voted for it, it was an overwhelming majority. And so uh, basically the mayor said, this is the will of the voters, so we're all in. Um, other jurisdictions and small, some, you know, some communities have said that they're either not in or that they're going to think about it. Um, like Sheridan is one of our neighboring, um, you know, uh, cities, and they're actually just starting now. So, you know, we're how many years in, and they're just going to start now. And then they've layered on, you know, um, their own licensing requirements. Just like we have excise and license, they have their own business licensing. They're only going to allow a certain number. They're going to add, you know, all of their restrictions that they want to have on top of that. So. Um, I don't know what the laws are going to be in Florida. Is that where you said you're coming from? That's um, another conversation, but yes. Um, yeah, so. It's strictly medical marijuana and it's very much state preempted. Right. So Optional imagine each state governments. is going to have, you know, something similar where they write that in. Um, if not, I would just say, you know, probably similar to Denver. We have many, many, many communities who contact us, you know, for either information or, you know, maybe not support in terms of resources or, you know, um, operations help or anything like that, but you know, I would just say if there's a larger city that you can look to to kind of help and see what they're doing, um, we we have a lot of that happening here. But in Colorado, that is a part of the law is that they can opt out. city said we don't want anything to do with this, and we're going to arrest people that do any of this. And and maybe I'm sort of getting into a bigger discussion of the law in terms of marijuana possession and all that. But I I do wonder how that works because I, I imagine you all are a magnet or Boulder's a magnet for maybe some people you'd rather not have here that are drawn here for the wrong reasons for some of this. I don't know that I would speak to that at all, but again, I mean, in Denver, you know, the voters, this is their will, and so, you know, as you a city employee, this is my job to, sure. um, you know, enforce and regulate um, responsibly, so that's what we're doing, um, personal feelings aside. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm from Monterey County, California, and we have, um, in the unincorporated areas, we have a tremendous uh, amount of greenhouses in the rural area. So we've taken a little bit of a different approach with greenhouses. We're trying to help them maintain their Group U occupancy and then force them to do the processing and manufacturing, of course, in separate buildings. But do, do you have any, any less uh, dense areas in your city limits, or do you, are you familiar with um, jurisdictions that have a more rural setting where these facilities are put, being put in? And uh, how do you, or do you deviate from the fire code uh, water requirements, uh, fire flow and, and that sort of thing? I mean, so I think that your question is related to do our requirements change based on like the density of the area? Is that correct? Right. So in the city, in the, no. you know, the, the more industrial areas, you have an established water system with hydrants and, and a public water purveyor. Do you have any areas in your jurisdiction that are not in established water system areas? Or do, are you familiar with other jurisdictions that are in that situation? So I would say that I can't speak to any other jurisdictions, and uh, perhaps Jill and Scott can add to this, but if, if a site did want to come in and do, you know, a ground-up development, they would have to go through our site development process, um, at which point they would look at the development from the ground up. They'd look at all the requirements there. You know, they'd look at do they need storm and sanitary sewers? Do they need, um, you know, Denver water to get involved? Do they have to put in hydrants? All of those requirements would apply at that stage. I don't know how many developments we've had where they've done ground up. Um, I think we would say that the majority of our marijuana facilities were moving into existing buildings. We have had some, um, but they would just have to go through that process and all of the codes would apply. Um, you know, zoning would get involved, um, all the agencies would have their say and they'd have to do what, whatever would be required, the same as any other industry. Um, but Jill can probably speak more to that. So, so I will say the couple of greenhouses we have were built specifically for marijuana and I, and I will say we probably are unique in treating them not as a U occupancy 
But we did that because they're not a typical greenhouse. Um, as I noted, what we are seeing, they still have lights. They have shades on the greenhouse to keep out sun. Um, so they're not using the greenhouse the way a greenhouse is, is typically used. So that was one of the reasons that led us to classify it as still being an F1 occupancy, but Eric or Scott. I wanted to ask for clarification. Were you inquiring about like tank storage type water supply facilities or? Right, so uh, if there is no established water system in, the, in that area, do you, you do you anything with that, so? I'm looking at one of our engineers to see, but I'm, I'm not sure that we've had any of these cases. Um, let me see if JD can speak to this at all. Yeah, we, in Denver, we don't have any of those types of cases. It's, it isn't, we've got a water system, okay. so we, we never come up with that situation. But we, there was a lot of discussion early on about the U and the F1. In the more rural areas of Colorado, I do know they call it a U. It was debated very heavily, but as far as water supplies, you're absolutely right. From a fire department, we want water. Right. And it, it becomes very problematic in trying to figure that out. But in Denver, we just don't have that problem because we're, we're pretty landlocked. And, and, and so, it, and, and what Jill said, we, we don't really think they're a U, just the way they're operated. Right. I, I don't know if that answers your question. It does for for the the way that your jurisdiction is set up. That makes sense. So. Yeah, we're just we're, we, yeah we don't we we've got the water. Okay. So. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Maines. I'm a fire inspector in Raymond, Maine, and I got I have two questions. One kind of a general question. We've there's been a couple of mentions at, at, throughout the day about. Um, how much regulation there can be on the home grows. Um, and my, my question is specifically to a couple of the slides, you know, showed um, some residential um, issues with, with butane and how much regulation there actually is in Denver with extraction in home grows. Is there a permit process? Is there a regulatory process? And if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. And then uh, my second question is more specific to Nicole and Mark, are there any lessons learned or changes to your either SOPs or to ordinances as you've learned how these rural facilities are operating in terms of not only protecting the inspectors but in, in protecting the first responders that may be responding to an alarm or to a call, an emergency call at that, that facility? Those are, that, those are really good questions. So I'm going to make up some really good answers. Uh, so as as far as home home uh, extraction, we 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 did address that in in uh, in uh, legislation through the city, um, and just clarified it for the the police. So um, I kind of alluded to that in my, my what I was saying earlier was the fire code does apply in a house. Um, we just don't inspect houses regularly. So um, the requirements for maintaining hazardous materials applies in your house. And um, operating using hazardous materials requ it meet, is required the same as a, in a commercial occupancy. Um, so we didn't have to, the fire department didn't have to necessarily make any changes or, or new regulations. It was, it was always illegal to release LPG to the atmosphere. That was in the code that's been in the code, hasn't changed. Um, any unsafe operations were still unsafe. So um, for us, it didn't help, it didn't change anything, but what the, the, the city ordinance did was it, it got us a lot of help in that um, the police were, be able, were actually able to follow up on complaints from neighbors and, uh, you know, get their warrants and, and, and prevent explosions. So we would come along after, after a fire or after explosion. Whereas the police were able to act proactively using surveillance and uh, warrants, so that's kind of the the reasoning behind that was it, it would it became more proactive using their. So it wasn't that the ordinance required anything new. It just kind of put a highlight on the fact that these are the things that are 
it not it, allowed. And it codified, yes, that it's not, basically said it's illegal to do LPG extractions in Denver except for uh, you can use, you can extract using 16 ounces of alcohol as long as you don't apply heat. So that pretty well allows water extractions, uh, butter, um, and, and, and an alcohol soak. So uh, that, that pretty well, what, and really what that really helped out was by being in the news, that explained it a lot to everybody else. So people that didn't know now knew. So it, it really helped two ways by getting that out to, the, to everybody that, that should know. And also it, it brought in help for us um, because that, you know the police are set up to do that kind of thing. The other side of it is when we began this process, all of our policies were geared toward first responder safety. So uh, when we started writing our policy and after, in between code cycles, we'll write a policy and then after that policy has been in place, then we can initiate that into our uh, amendments. So we wrote our policies based on what, what was our goal to regulate and how are we going to not only protect first responders but also employees. And that, that the benefit to that was our, our concerns went way down because now we know what, what's going on because we uh, required it. Um, there's no more of that unknown and that was kind of, I didn't do a very good job of explaining that, but in that, uh, my slideshow, that was what was going on in these places. And, and so our research showed what was going on and then we modified our policies to to make sure that everything failed safe. So the CO2 uh, enrichment systems, if the power goes out, the CO2 uh, turns off. Um, we, we did some extensive research trying to figure out what was the hazard, what created the hazard, and uh, and how do we mitigate that? Pesticides was another one that we uh, really initiated a, a, a kind of a proactive approach on that, even though it wasn't quite technically our purview, simply because we had an issue where uh, several cops got sick after clearing a building. And uh, so we, we wrote our requirements for that specifically to protect first responders without um, interfering with the uh, authority of the Colorado Department of Agriculture, who regulates pesti pesticides. So I hope that answers your yeah, question. No, okay, you. good. I made up some good stuff. Whew. Thank you. And then more maybe from the home grow perspective, I'll just note that our zoning code um, puts limits on the number of plants that can be grown per person in a dwelling unit. Um, so that is set at six plants per person, but with a max of 12. So even if let's say you have three adults, 21 or over, um, living within a, a dwelling unit, they would only be allowed to grow 12 plants maximum. And that's a good point too. We we, we sat down as a city and decided that that was the maximum that would uh, be allowed, not based on plants alone. It was uh, the infrastructure required to support those plants. Uh, uh, your usual single family dwelling uh, was only capable of providing that, that amount of electricity, natural gas, water, et cetera, in order to be safe. So that was why we base that on, on on twelve plants. It wasn't just an arbitrary number. It was it was it was well thought out on our part. In case anybody was wondering. Hi there. One of um, my goals as my city in Maine moves forward with implementation is making sure my inspectors have the tools to ensure everyone's safe. And that's what I heard both of you, both groups, echo. How much? How far do the standardized codes get you? It sounds like you both have some pretty specialized additions, so IRC, IBC, and then the NFPA codes. It sounds like they're not enough, and you're writing your own specialty additions onto those. Go ahead, Scott. Well, 
I was just going to go first Jill. and say I don't know that on the, the building code side of the world we have done that much, to be honest with you, on the marijuana front in terms of making changes. Uh, we have the IR, one IRC amendment related to number of services, and that was, quite frankly, the definitions they used in their own section didn't match the definitions in the definitions of Chapter 2 to, from a legal standpoint, clearly tie the number of services together. So we had to tweak that a bit. And I think the only other one that we've done a code amendment is that occupancy, the number of oc occupant load. Eric, what was that? And, I mean, yeah. So that's just a policy, actually. No, it's um, in the amendments now. But, oh, yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. From an occupant load factor perspective, in terms of grow facilities, uh, we've recognized the reduced number of occupants in those spaces. Um, which may not speak directly to, to your question regarding um, development for first responders and things like that. But I think the fire department has developed a significant uh, number of policies from a design perspective that secondarily assist in the safety of those first responders. And I think maybe Nicole can speak to this a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> so in, in from the, on the fire side, uh, even though we, we talk a lot about the Denver amendments and stuff like that, those were clarifications of, of existing code. It's not like we just kind of rewrote a whole new marijuana code. Um, most of what, what we draw from, and, and JD can jump in if I start getting off track, but um, most of what we, we use to enforce uh, is, is drawn from NFPA standards as well as the international suite of codes. So we, we, we didn't really write new codes. What, what we've amended is a clarification of procedures with CO2 enrichment, what we want. Because in the, especially the CO2 side, there, wasn't, there isn't really a lot in the codes for that. So that was based on experience. And I see JD's at this, so I'm obviously off track. I'll, just, I'll be real concise, but, but you're absolutely right. We, the NFPA standards, the fire codes have a lot of information in them, and it, it addresses all the applications that they're doing in these facilities, but it doesn't call it what, what we're seeing. So they're using propane or butane to do extraction, but, and it's in a closed system. So you have to go into those standards and those codes and try to find where does it talk about using propane. If they're using carbon dioxide, you need to go into a code that talks about that. And that's kind of how we had to ex extract all that information out. And so we put it into a, the reason we wrote a chapter was to tell people how we're enforcing the standards that we have. And, that, and that's why we did it. So it, it, if we didn't do it, it, it then they, they didn't know how we were interpreting and enforcing the codes. So, so the national codes, per, for the most part, will cover it. But you kind of have to figure out, for example, in the marijuana industry, they use, they do a, a process called distillation, where they use alcohol and they put it in a device called a rotovape. That, that terminology I just said, you're not going to find it anywhere. So how do you know how to regulate it? Well, one of the NFPA standards for flammable liquids talks about distillation. But you kind of got to go in and be able to find that. But I ducked a lot more than I thought I should, so sorry. But, but, but it... <laughs> Write it, you do really do need to write something to try to help people. Does that make sense? Does that ex answer your question? It does. it does. It sounds like the tools are there in the standardized codes, and it's really making sure everyone's on the same page about the interpretation and enforcement of that. Is that? JD, what chapter is that? Or is it appendix? 39. So chapter 39 in our code. Okay. Still chapter 39 of the Denver Fire Code. Okay. Great. Thank Sorry. you. Good. Uh, good afternoon. It's, my name is Gary. I'm a fire marshal from Edmonton, Alberta. Two questions. I'll just ask the questions. I can sit down and let you answer them. First question is, after occupancy is granted, do you find uh, when you go back and re inspections that they would add additional security measures, electromagnetic locks unapproved, uh, um, change to hardware, that type of thing? So that's the first question. No. Oh, yes. Second, <laughs> yes, second question. Are huge issue. Okay, and second question: um, Are there associated additional false alarms related to just commercial grow grow ops and a spike compared to any other type of occupancy? So, you don't know. Well, okay, you sure? All right. Uh, so, the 
egress turns out to be one of our biggest issues. Um, and that was, that's probably one of my worst areas of the fire code. So um, I, got, I got schooled up and, and I'm a very simple person. So my, uh, the way I explain it to everybody is you can lock people out, but you can't lock them in. So if that, if that passes my, the Mark Rudolph test of keeping it simple, if I can get out of this place, then, then we're good. So uh, it's been a, we, we do spend a, quite a bit of time uh, explaining uh, our requirements, the reasons why behind them. And uh, the intention is that the more time I spend now in, in these first 10, 15 years, um, hopefully that'll save us a lot of time in the, further down the line. So we're trying to bring this industry up, up with everybody else and get them fast-tracked up and, and, and meet everybody, you know, catch up with everybody else as far as just, oh, this is just standard procedure. We know we don't put thumb turn latches on exit doors. So um, we, we, that, the education component is, is, is huge for us. That, it, it's frustrating for Nicole. How come you guys haven't got your inspections done today? Well, I've been educating. So, um, and uh, so, yes. Exiting is, is tough, and uh, everybody wants to create their own Fort Knox. And what was your other question? I'm sorry. Oh, the Farth Farms. We don't, uh, fortunately, we don't, you know, these are F1 occupancies. The, we don't get a lot of issues regarding that um, as much as you would think. Uh, it's all pretty straightforward, and um, because I do such an excellent job of inspecting, they don't have a lot of false alarms. <laughs> so I think we have two minutes left, so maybe one last question. Oh, hopefully this is easy. I'm Katie Williams. I'm a detective with Breckenridge PD. Are you making the results of your inspections public to help uh, customers choose which businesses they want to buy from? So for us, um, if you, if someone was to do a CORA request for inspections, we would provide them. We do give the facility a copy of their inspection report, um, and then we also mail one to the property owner with their invoice. Um, as far as just handing them out freely, we wouldn't do that, but they are um, public records, so if somebody wanted them, we would, we would provide them. Um, as far as, you know, kind of working with other agencies, we do get requests from um, state agencies. For example, when they're cut, um, conducting some sort of an investigation, um, excise and license, we share our records with them. Um, so within the city or the state, we do share those um, more freely, but if someone requested them, you know, on a Coro, we would, of course, provide them. But nothing similar to, like, a restaurant where you No. They're not online or available. Yeah. You can just click and get them. No. Mm -mm. And then I'll just note from um, with our um, permitting system that we changed to in mid 2015, anyone could essentially get on one of our newest portals and search by address to get a permit history, um, but that wouldn't necessarily give them in detailed inspection information or issues. Good. The questions were easy. We like that. Thank you. I will, I will say the last comment is, is an intriguing one because I think there's probably a benefit that if we could capture some things like the hardware, as a, you know, commonly, um, you know, common errors or things we see in the field so that the industry, you know, not necessarily pinpointing addresses but sort of uh, common non-compliant um, Things that are seen during inspections. If we if we were to, to post something like that, it's probably a good idea to give the industry an idea. The conversation that happened at the sustainability conference over the last couple of days about um, fair wage and employee treatment or pesticides or any of those various things that can hurt employees or the consumers that are being hidden behind the marketing. Um, it just seems like the information is there and mm -hmm. the customers could kind of help yeah. eliminate the bad actors. We have the information. So I, I guess I would just say to that point, um, as far as the common items, you know, on inspections that we have issues with, um, to Scott's point, we do have that available. And then as far as, you know, your question and sharing the information maybe more freely, 
Um, our database, as I talked about, we're using Firehouse, and that's just not set up to have you know, a, a um, citizen-facing you know, access. Um, perhaps if we do move to a new system, it'll have that capability. But again, um, we have had some, uh, like your example of you know, employees requesting information, um, we, ha we have provided that because, again, you know, that's a law in Colorado, so if you request any amount of records for me, um, we'll give them to you. If it's excessive, we do charge a fee just based on the time that it's going to take to pull those. But there's no, um, there's no intent on our part to not share those. It's just that our system doesn't, you know, you can't just log in an address and see what happened there. Um, but we do share those records. We just have a process to release them. So if you need anything, just, you know, reach out to us and we'll get it for you. So I think with that, thank you all very much for coming and thanks to everyone on the panel today. We appreciate it.